first talk, which is really the second, which is the first of this session, Peter Marchetto is going to be talking about systematic uncertainties in bioacoustic recording devices. Hi, I'm Pete, and I'm the backup plan. <laughs> um, I'm guessing you guys know what this is. It's cheap. It's a tiny, tiny little antique dollar recorder I got off of Amazon. And last night in my hotel room, I calibrated it, which shouldn't surprise you because it doesn't take that much. I also did something else very unwise. If you saw me, please. Took the back off of it to take a look at what the chip is inside. And because I'm crazy, I was up until about 11.30 looking up what the reference voltage is supposed to be, what the ADC bit depth is, and all these things in here. And I won't trust it as far as I can throw it until after I get a calibration out of it, and you'll see why in a moment. So, um, we're going to talk about uncertainty. And I know that for a lot of people, uncertainty comes down to this. I have a recording. What are we uncertain about? So, there are many recorders on the market. I've worked with some of these. I was involved in the development in at least one of those. But this is not time for me to do my own form. The measurements that you get out of your acoustic recordings are the things that come with uncertainty. So those nice little parentheses next to them with the plus and minus and the number after them. Despite what you may have been told, those aren't optional. So frequency is a measurement, and therefore can have an uncertainty attached to it. SPL, intensity or magnitude, is a measurement, and therefore can have an uncertainty attached to it. <laughs> and now, of course, whether or not I have Wi-Fi. <laughs> Um, and time is also something that is a measurement and therefore you know, a number attached to it uh, and an uncertainty. Secondary to that, we have things like ICI for marine mammal folks in the room. Raise your hand if you know what I mean when I say ICI right off the top of your head. Good. Interclick inter interval for everybody else. Um, location. If you're localizing something, then if you have a little bit of clock drift, it can drift into a lot of meters. Say, for example, I put one of the, I can say this because I used to work there, so I'm sorry Danielle and everybody else from BRP, but I put one of the BRP Marus down for three months in Massachusetts Bay and I drift by five minutes. Five minutes times 1,500 meters per second to the speed of sound in water. You see what I'm getting at? Now imagine you've got four or more units and you're trying to localize off of them. How many whale lengths is that by the end of three months? <laughs> Yeah, so unless you have some way of compensating for especially temperature-induced drift, screw it. Noise pollution, obviously that has to do with SPL. Masking also has to do with SPL as well as frequency components. All of these are things that we quantify in numbers and therefore need parentheses after them with a nice little plus or minus and a number. And speed, Doppler shift, that's another thing that we can get out as a secondary measurement. So now it's time for the blame game. Hi, I'm Pete and I have a problem. My problem is that I blame things. I blame the environment. I blame the microphone. No, the hydrophone. No, the geophone. No, some other transducer. I blame the blasted cables. I blame my batteries because they ran below a certain threshold voltage and now my reference voltage inside of my recorder isn't what it's supposed to be. And I'm shrinking my dynamic range as my batteries run out. That actually happens. It doesn't happen much in modern recorders, but it used to happen more in digital recorders and has actually been a problem in the video production industry, or was for quite some time before we went fully digital. Of course, I can always blame the computer again, and I can always blame the undergrads for doing the wrong file, but <laughs> rather not. Now, insofar as environment goes, I want to make clear to you guys that you don't know what you're measuring until you know what the context is that you're measuring it in. If you don't know the speed of sound in your medium, you do not know what you've measured in your medium. If you don't know the speed of sound, you don't know the acoustic impedance, you don't have a full idea of the context in which you're working. So, if you're working in air, take the temperature, take the relative humidity, take the barometric pressure, and then <coughs> this mess is how you get your actual speed of sound. 
Similarly, there's a similar mess for C, T, and D in water, conductivity, temperature, and depth, or salinity, temperature, and depth. All right, so the transducer is a major source of uncertainty for us. And here's three different types. Here's the piezo down at the bottom, up top there, analog devices has this really nice cutaway view of a little um, capsule electric mic on their website. And here's a uh, cutaway view of the geophone. All of these are mechanical systems which can have coupling issues and which can also have issues within themselves where they either overdamp or underdamp what you're trying to record. So if I, for example, overload a microphone, oh wait, do this right here. I overload a microphone. <laughs> then you wind up with modulation because of the fact that something is clamping and stuff. Either a diaphragm's hitting, the limit of its travel, etc. There's a lot of different ways that transducers can misbehave. Remember also, these are mechanical things. Therefore, if you have expansion or contraction due to temperature, your mechanical coupling or your acoustic coupling is going to fail relative to what you expect it should be. So always respect the fact that your transducer <coughs> needs to have a known environment in which it can work. And if you are working out in a cold or very warm environment, at least note the temperature and then when you get back to the lab, or when you have the funding to get somebody else to do it for you, or if you call me up and I figure out a way to do it for you for free, I'm not plugging my lab or anything. Actually, CLO is the one that I worked with with the uh, ANCO chamber. But do some sort of post comp calibration or characterization of your transducers so you know how they should behave in the field in the temperature that you experience. Now, Transfer function. Now we really get into it. You have the origin of your sound, the medium through which it's transferred, the transducer into which it's transferred, the transmission line that takes that back to your recorder, the analog stage that does the filtering, the analog to digital converter, and then finally the microcontroller and storage inside of your recording device. These are seven different stages. And I have a cat video. <laughs> So let's say that this is our acoustic signal. My cat, Kyo, if this will play, falling asleep. Kyo makes this wonderful little chuffing noise when he falls asleep, kind of like... <laughs> Unfortunately, the video's not playing. But imagine that we have that moving through this transfer function. We start off with at the origin point, and then it goes through the air into the microphone. The microphone picks it up. Unfortunately, Kyo's a little bit too close, so it overmodulates. You wind up with the diaphragm hitting the limit of its travel. Just for one little part of the peak of one of those chuffs, you wind up with clipping. Now we move into the transmission line. Now luckily, I was recording this video on my phone. The transmission line is virtually nil. I mean, there's like two little wires in there. One goes to ground, one goes to the ADC. But if you have a 100 foot long or a 300 foot long cable, you're running into some interesting problems. One way that you can counter that is by using what's known as a guard. There's a couple of different methods. You can put an amplifier on the microphone side rather than at the recorder side. And also, there's always the possibility that you do your encoding directly at the microphone. There are a number of, and actually I owe Kurt Pristrup a great bit of gratitude for me even knowing about these, but there is a number of these tiny little MEMS mics nowadays that have the analog to digital converter built right in, so you're sending digital signals back that don't degrade nearly as much as your analog would. Anyway, then we go into the ADC and storage. Now it's time for a nice little audience participation exercise. I need 70 volunteers. Okay, I've got one over here, two, three, come on up. <laughs> I've got four. Anybody? We need yeah. seven. Um, six. <laughs> and seven. Number seven. Who's the brave soul who's going to be number seven? I really do need seven people up here. <laughs> it's a pretty good sex ratio up there. <laughs> 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 I do need a seventh person for this to work. All right. Well, everybody except for the last person. I need you all 
to shuffle down so that she can speak into this microphone. So now, you are the, I'm going to be speaking to you, you're going to be the origin point. Uh, I'm going to give you information and you're going to whisper it into her ear. She is the medium through which it's transferred. She's going to pass it on to Adam, who is the transducer. Then, Rada, you're the transmission line. You're going to be the analog stage, you the ABC, and you are going to be <coughs> storage, but in this case you're actually just going to be parroting back what they said. <laughs> and at no point can any of you guys look at the screen behind you. You will notice in this that at the end of each one of these sentences, this is by the way it, what's known as the announcer's test from CBS, Back in the 1930s, every radio announcer needed to do this. <laughs> and after each phrase, I have the number of bits in the Shannon entropy for each one of those phrases. And we're going to compound the Shannon entropy by adding a phrase each time. Six pairs of John L. Verso's tweezers, 7,000 Macedonians in full battle array, eight brass monkeys from the ancient sacred crypts of Egypt, nine apathetic, sympathetic, diabetic old men on roller skates with a market propensity towards procrastination and sloth, ten lyrical, spherical, diabolical denizens of the deep who haul stall around the corner of the quill of the quay of the quiver at all at the same time. So, that is better than a whole bunch of humans standing together trying to take data. <laughs> Now that I've convinced you that automation may be the way to go for recording, oh wait. <laughs> what I want to get at is how what we're expecting differs from what we actually see. There are variables that we have to deal with. Variables in the microphone, for example, 
On this thing, we've got something that's very similar to the venerable WM61 Panasonic capsule microphone. Um, I refer to most things as being WM61 style when they're like this. It's really simple, like the analog devices cross section we saw before. There's this tiny little transistor that acts as a source side amplifier right behind a really, really tiny variable capacitor, which is two plates. And we just look at the voltage going up and down through that. Um, the logarithmic sensitivity of said microphone is supposedly about 35 plus or minus 4 decibels relative to, and here's one thing, re, one volt per pascal. The linear sensitivity, therefore, must be 0 0.0178 volt per pascal, or I don't know my logarithms. And the frequency response is, and then that, up to about 15-ish K. Variables in the recorder. The reference voltage, this is the reason I took the back off of my recorder last night, was actually to look up online the chip that runs this thing and where the reference voltage was so I could know what my actual reference levels were. And also to look up the fact that despite the fact that this is billed as a 24-bit recorder, yes, indeed, it only records 16 bits. Two words I always teach my engineering students. Data sheets, lie. <laughs> Luckily, the manufacturer lies even more, so the data sheet actually kind of tells the truth. The recorder sensitivity, then, is just the reference voltage divided by 2 to the n, where n is the number of bits. So, our sensitivity is approximately 0 0.000023, plus or minus that number, volts per least significant bit. And yes, I was probing tiny little things on the back of this thing in my hotel room last night with a multimeter so I could figure that out. That means that one least significant bit is 0 0.000023, plus or minus 1, volts. What does that mean then? When you combine that with a microphone data sheet, we find that our sensitivity, one least significant bit, <coughs> is going to be 0 0.000023 volts. That's a very small amount. And the other nice thing is that now we know how many pascals, or how many volts per pascal we have. So that means that we can get a total sensitivity of one least significant bit. At 16 bits wide, this thing can't record anything below a noise floor than theoretically of 36.26 dB 320 micropascals. So, long math, there's a little bit of poking around on line doing stuff like that, but I can calculate out what the uncertainty should be on this. And then I did a characterization, and these things are amazing. They're only about 100 bucks on Amazon. Every field recorder should have one in their field kit. This is a microphone calibrator. It just plays one tone at two volumes. That's at 94 dB, and that's at 114 dB. It's just a 1K tone. But at least it's something that's calibrated. Actually, it's the first time I've ever seen an Amazon calibration sticker on anything, but apparently they do it for less than 100 bucks. And I can definitively say now, when I bring this thing's files into Raven, this is 10,000 LSB in Raven, that's 1,000 LSB in Raven, that's 114 dB, this is 94 dB. So, I can go back and say I have a rough calibration curve, and that my sensitivity is 998 decibels, uh, sorry, 998 e significant bits per pascal. So, that means then, for us, that we can we see in our calculation that we have 769 least significant bits per pascal. In our characterization, we've got almost a thousand. Data sheet versus reality is a 23% difference. Get one of these, use it whenever you can. Then we also have the fact that that's only at one kilohertz. If you have the chance, if you can send a series of tones into the thing you're recording with, do those same two values, but across the frequency range that you're working in. And finally, I just wanted to get why, get at why this thing is so useful, is that it's actually calibrated traceably. So this goes back three generations to the NIST labs at either um, Gaithersburg, Maryland, or at Boulder, Colorado. 
three generations of calibration through the Amazon calibration service, back to whoever serviced their stuff, and then back through them, either one or two generations, to the National Institute of Standards and Technology, and finally back to BIPM in France. So that way, if you use one of these on your mic, or your hydrophone, or your geophone, or your whatever, as long as you calibrate it, then every one of you can share data with me, and we know there are numbers in the same realm of uncertainty and actually can be traced back to the same measurements. So calibrate your stuff. If you don't know how, ask someone who does. Without calibration, we lose even the uncertainty in our data, but there's hope we can fix it. That's it. Any questions? I've got plus or minus two hertz on the tone, and I've got plus or minus, I think it's 1.5 dB on sound levels. With V and K, I'm going to be moving in closer to like less than 0.5 dB, and probably going to be spot on to like uh, 0.01 hertz instead. So you're paying for a higher precision. But at least this gets you in the ballpark. Can this one accommodate different sizes? Uh, it's designed for half-inch capsules, but it can easily be used on things smaller than a half-inch. An that being said, there are certainly ones available with larger bores. And if worse comes to worse, you could always just measure from this out some distance, and then actually look at the attenuation based on that. Okay. It's happy, but... <laughs> Sorry. Thank you. Okay.